is fantastic. Uh, Mario as Fossage co-founder and someone who has a particular interest in making this work. Uh, and Meng Wong, who has a background in, amongst other things, uh, running an accelerator for startups. Uh, and the particular importance of that will become clear later in the panel. So, uh, before I go anywhere with the panelists, firstly, some background. Why this panel, or how it came about. Three years ago, we had Dr. Vivian Balakrishnan, then Minister for Environment, currently for Foreign Affairs, came to FOSS Asia and spoke about open source and open data. And in his marathon Q&A, one of the questions he asked was, you know, how many people in the room would like to become millionaires out of open source software? And his, this is no, not a joke, because he was really concerned that a whole lot of people are going to spend years of their lives driving creative endeavor into this stuff because we love doing it, because it's fun, and not derive profits by it, indeed to have other people do so. And so his concern was, you know, how many of us are going to be in the room are going to be able to build businesses that will thrive on the development of open source software, or at least substantial development of open source software as a side effect. Uh, also, as a Minister of Government, of course, he has an interest in strengthening the economy, not merely uh, looking after the people in the room. So I, I'll come back to that question in a moment, because I'm going to ask the people in the room the same question. The second part of the genesis for the panel is the FOSS Asia organization itself, which has a little bit of the cobbler's children problem. Uh, FOSS Asia is involved in, in promoting open source and indeed in, in teaching people to program in the first place, uh, all of whom then promptly go and get jobs uh, from companies who pay much more than FOSS Asia can pay. And we therefore have difficulty uh, funding some of our own infrastructure work. And so there's a, uh, a question there around how to do that. So this is in fact a sort of consulting session for, for FOSS Asia, in addition to being a, a panel for the conference. Uh, before I direct questions to the panelists, I will now ask questions of the audience. Uh, the first, the, Dr. Vivian's question, how many people in the room would like to become millionaires out of developing open source software? Oh God, only about half. Okay, well, let's just start. Um, how many people in the room are already... Uh, that's an even smaller... No, that wasn't quite the question. Um, yeah, let's stick with US dollars, um, are currently earning a living, I, I would suggest as either an employee or as a freelancer, where much or all of your work is developing open source software. Okay, so there's ooh, almost a third, so that's, well, perhaps a quarter. That's, so that's actually quite healthy. Um, how many or are there any who are uh, in a more entrepreneurial mode looking to build businesses? Um, creating open source software, a few of those, wonderful. Um, one other category, who I'm afraid I won't serve very well in this discussion other than the sort of broad overview, and I know there's a few over there, uh, how many in the room are in large organizations uh, trying to understand how best to engage with or use or take advantage of or develop open source software to sort of sustain those businesses uh, or to develop those businesses rather than sort of strike it on their own? Oh, okay, a few more than I expected. Okay, uh, is anyone in the room for any other reason? <laughs> they, were, they were all the cases I could think of, but I, you no? Know, okay, fabulous. So, uh, <laughs> I, will, I have prepared notes because this is actually quite a large, complicated topic. Um, so fundamental differences. The, the description for the panel uh, session in the, in the program starts out with the observation that free and open source software is different to closed software, not just because the license is different, because the ways of, of benefiting are different. And we've just seen uh, great examples of that in Kubernetes. Um, the question that that begs in my mind is, where's the money for open developers? We have a good sense of where it is for closed developers. You either sell licenses or you, you uh, sell service, running your software on your own computers. Where is it for open developers? Um, I think I might start this one with Chris. Uh, who's, sure. who's, who's paying uh, for things that cause uh, the creation and, and strengthening of open source software? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so I've been at Red Hat for about 13 years selling uh, free software. And I would say uh, you know, one of the sweet spots is certainly uh, in regulated industries. Uh, they tend to certainly 
uh, have a need for security, for uh, a contact to get support and help. So traditional sort support subscriptions have been very popular with regulated industries. Uh, they're a little bit less risk taking uh, in terms of going on their own as well. So positive uh, way of saying it. That's been uh, uh, sectors like telco, public government, uh, finance, also uh, healthcare, and any other regulated industry. So I, I think looking forward, like the transportation industry, is certainly another key industry as well. As cars autonomous start driving, driving themselves. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Dusan, you have perhaps another broader source of uh, customers who are paying for open source development. And, and feel free to outline what you're doing for the benefit of the audience. Everyone knows who Red Hat is. I don't think everyone knows who Bounty Source is. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm actually a traditional early stage investor who wants to make money out of my investments. Um, and, uh, but I'm also third generation Nikola Tesla, so I guess I'm a little bit nuts. Um, so uh, I, we, we looked at this company called uh, Bounty Source three, four years ago. Uh, I think at that stage we had about 10,000 open source developers registered, which doesn't mean that everybody's active. And uh, basically we went to the market. It had actually existed for 10 years uh, as a community, but we kind of gave it a restart in 2013, 14. And basically said, are there companies that you know, would like to pose their pr a problem, a bounty, um, and uh, then you know, would any of these 10,000 open source developers claim it and solve it and get paid? And that's really the business model of uh, bounty source. So uh, today there are 48,000 registered, I would just say, open source developers. Obviously, everybody's not active. Uh, you can see all the stats at the bottom of the page if you want to see how many are active or not active per day and month and how many issues and bounties are out there. And we went out and uh, yes, we did find some um, uh, companies that were interested in that and um, mainly uh, tech companies to start with. So our largest contributor and customer is actually IBM, which is a little bit surprising, I, I would say. And I think it has to do with people, that there is a very strong advocate within IBM who just loves this and somehow managed to get four of his departments to do this. So that's one model. So that means that the bounty is worth $10,000. You go, you take it, claim it, solve the problem, and you get 10%. C can you stay? Sorry, sorry. The open source developer gets 90%. We get 10%. Yes, yes. Yeah. No. <laughs> Not the other way around. Vitally important to yeah. get that the right way around. I, I, I didn't think to ask before the session, are you able to talk in dollar terms about the sort of volume of business on the market or is that not yet public? How much? Oh no, it's all on the, on the site as well. Uh, so you can, uh, you can actually get, get the numbers on the site. Actually, I don't know on top of my, my head how much okay. it is. But you know, you see daily volume if you just look at the site right now that you can see that there are a couple thousand dollars per day. I mean, you see, you see it all in real time. So it's very transparent. So that's one way. Now, the other way that I think is actually more interesting, this is from the corporate point of view, right? But the other way is that it's what we call SALT, which is the Roman word for decent salary. Um, so that's the second product there. And what that means is if you, if you do have a project, it's more more the kind of three, four, five, six entrepreneurs here. So if you do have a project and want somebody to share the cost of your project, you go to SALT. And then I can put with my credit card a monthly contribution of a dollar, five, ten, fifteen, which is a recurrent takeaway from my credit card. And that actually has worked really well. You can see how the salt project has gone up. You can see all the statistics. So there are hundreds of micro projects there that basically where you get contribution on a monthly basis. And then each of the project owners explains what he's going to do with the money, if it's a milestone or, or how does it work. So you kind of follow the project. So that has worked. I don't want to say that it's a huge unicorn, but it's going in the right direction. Uh, we got some new owners uh, recently. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I believe that this can actually take off now. This, this is, uh, that doesn't concern me. I, I, my purpose for the panel was to start putting real examples in front of people to make it yeah. real. So, so the fact that it's fledgling is, is fine. Uh, on that model, I, when you first described it, I thought it was a bit strange. But I then realized that I do exactly that as a member of Hackerspace here and as a contributor to Wikipedia. In both cases, I just have an automatic monthly payment uh, that supports those projects. So it's actually not that everybody will do it, but it's not an entirely unusual model to set that up. So I, 
Yeah, I'm extremely impressed with this model. I want to see it grow. Man, you had some thoughts, I suspect, on uh, other places where uh, obvious and really quite acute needs for uh, open source expertise to be applied to problems that are hurting large businesses and small businesses and everything in between. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about this, and, and to me, software is a means of expression. You've got this programming language, and then you write programs in it, which other people feel very strong emotions about when they need to maintain it. Um, <laughs> And so in that sense, it's kind of like uh, creative writing. Um, it's the sort of thing that gets sponsored on Patreon or on Etsy, right? Only the difference is the stuff that we make as programmers is able to run not just inside people's heads, it's able to run on software, um, hardware, sort of machines that are sort of in the cloud. And the, the interesting analogy there is people pay for this kind of expression in all kinds of different ways. And uh, authors and journalists are, ex are asking exactly the same questions about how do we get paid in this brave new world. Um, so for me, I was thinking back to a great work of literature, uh, The Time Machine by H.G. Wells, which if you remember, in the far future, there are two kinds of people. There are the Eloi who live in the sun, and there are the Morlocks who live underground in the sort of steam tunnels. And it's, I think the analogy is that the, the Eloi are the people who use the apps in the app store and they pay for the apps. And then the interface is really interesting, right? Because underneath, you've got the Morlocks who are doing the engineering, and the Morlocks are now having to figure out how to have their own little underground markets in the form of bounty source and salt. So that's, a, that's just an observation. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the serious issue here is that if SSL doesn't get paid for, if GPG doesn't get paid for, there are serious consequences both underground and above in the real world. And in fact, those are the ones that I was particularly um, thinking of as, as acute problems, because right. those are, like, everyone depends on a pencil. Cell. That's right. These are what we might call public goods, right? Yeah. And yet, governments are all saying, you know, why should we be the ones to pay for it? You know, we pay for roads, we pay for hospitals, we pay for schools, we don't pay for software. <laughs> they pay for police. I mean, yeah. So I, I, anyway, the argument there, I think, is that this is um, perhaps to, to your fundamental question, there are a number of sources of demand where there is, I feel, compelling reason to believe people will pay for things that people need. Um, the list of approaches is enormous, and this is, I don't, I thought about it, I don't think we can do this justice in a, in a 60 minute panel. Um, uh, Lemonade Stand is a project uh, that the lady who researches this specifically does. She's listed on GitHub the 20 major ways people. Uh, sort of make money on, on open source. But I'm just going to skip that section because we could spend two hours on that alone. But the public goods question uh, is, I suspect, the, uh, the broader area to dig. And so is, I don't know, Meng has a <laughs> deep understanding of this problem, is public goods funding something that any of the other panelists have considered? We should microphone, so I didn't that. Chris, Mario, have any of you guys had reason to think about public goods funding? Public, uh, how could the funding you? of public goods, so public infrastructure, security, things of that kind, which are. So how? Yeah. Well, how do yeah. So uh, yeah. So this idea has been around for some time. Um, I remember the Creative Commons uh, uh, idea that uh, we have. Uh, like public goods, and we have that in Europe, um, so that, uh, for example, like for, for television, for radio and so on, that everyone has to pay a certain amount. So this was a question like when like the music came on in Napster, all these things, like this was a big discussion at that time, um, but like, uh, yeah, there are different models now. Um, I don't know, like, so the question with these models is always who distributes them, yeah? What is the perfect way to distribute it and, and who controls it? Um, so I don't know, like um, the states, there are so many states and, and I, I don't think like the state is a, it's a good distributor of these kind of services, yeah? I mean, how, how do you measure? Do you measure like uh, according to users? Okay, well then you can just stay with the current, uh, current model. So I, I don't know, like, so there are two, two ways to approach this question of how to make money with uh, FOSS. One way is the current system, like how, how is the setup, how can actually, uh, um, how can FOSS um, entrepreneurs 
succeed in the current system? And the second question is, uh, how can we adapt a system to the needs of open source? Because it's uh, um, uh, good for the, uh, oh, how, how do you say, a a a good for the public benefit? Yeah? yeah, yeah, you could say like that. So, um, so open source people, open source applications, they're often doing good. They benefit everyone. Okay, so these are two different questions, and at the moment, I think I would rather focus on this question of uh, how can we succeed in this uh, uh, in, in this environment? Because yeah, we have to talk on a different level, maybe too. Uh, sure, I, I I was thinking more the. Uh, sorry, I kind of have a slightly different angle on it. So I was in Dubai last uh, when was it last Sunday? They work on Sundays, which is great. It gives me an extra working day. So so you know they want to put what they are putting the whole public administration on blockchain, um, the vision of 2020, uh, the land registry, the tourist board, whatever. And obviously it's not exactly, you know, all our 48,000 open source developers wouldn't actually have exactly the skill sets that, that they are requesting. But for me, that was an embryo of a very interesting kind of public partnership with our community to see if we could tap in from, you know, if they could put in bits and pieces, like in bounties of that big projects and offer that out. You that that I actually believe in and I see it in a very pragmatic way that we can because they don't have, you know, they don't have forty eight thousand you know developers and uh, I mean they can take all the developers to Dubai but they're never gonna solve it. So I, I was kind of asking them if they could kind of put it in bits and pieces and put it in counter bounties the way we work. And the, obviously it's it's a vision, obviously it's gonna take ages. But that's where I believe there is an opportunity. Uh, in countries that are open up uh, opening up their public uh, administration that way. And they see that it can't be done maybe just with the big guys like IBM or Consensus or whatever. So that is, I think, an opportunity. We, we had a Singapore government rep uh, keynoting last year at FOSS Asia announcing such a program within Singapore, exactly that they are letting out the contract in small pieces yeah. that don't need giant contractors exactly because Singapore has historically always been about strengthening Singapore Inc. and therefore the two or three major SIs here. Yeah, that's true. And and now, but the it's now being recognized that there's a number of problems with that. One that we care about, which is that open source developers get paid, mm -hmm. but, but a bunch of other related problems. And so there's, there's an active initiative to do exactly what you're describing, mm -hmm. to, to the point where it's possible to slice out small pieces mm -hmm. and, and contract them out to uh, individual developers. So, sure. You made another point to me, though, about the, the ICOs that have all occurred in the last 12 months and the amount of engineering talent that they're going to need in order yeah. to deliver. Yeah, so that's more of a Robin Hood, right? So all these companies, they raise so much money, so they need, need to use it, right? So, 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 so there my view is that whatever, what was it now, eight, I can't remember numbers, I, I don't quote me on this, but I think it was 891 projects that raised about $6 billion last year. And, and one thing that they don't have a clue about is actually how they're going to execute those because they've, they've all put some kind of white papers, but they don't have a clue really what to do. And I think that's another opportunity um, to tap in, into. Uh, and I, I, I really think that that could be, re, re, uh, you know, uh, more than a decent uh, 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 Roman uh, salary, you know, more than salt, because they actually do have money. So that's m maybe another opportunity. Sorry. So, okay, so I, uh, like, uh, okay, how to make money with FOSS? Of course, you can have a job somewhere i mean like an, an, you can have a job as an open source developer everywhere today so you don't need like an, a FOSS company but where are the new big or the companies that get big the new big FOSS companies where are they um, like so there are a few uh, okay but like they are mainly maybe from the west but which are the ones uh, started in recent years like uh, when red hat was started and we followed it the first few years we thought okay they're gonna be like a lot of these kind of companies we see uh, companies like, uh, that are established, traditional companies uh, switching more and more to open source, but like, uh, I don't see so, so many like, companies that actually become big and make a, uh, an open source model. And especially my question is, what about Asia? We are here in Asia, like uh, a lot of these companies, of course they have a longer tradition in Europe and the US uh, with the open source, but uh, I think in order to succeed with this also different vision of how knowledge, how, how everything is shared. Uh, we need uh, more companies here in um, Asia who really like founded by open source and free software contributors and, and who follow this model of sharing. So uh, how can we get this done apart from uh, job opportunities? Um, and uh, the interesting thing that I uh, see here is uh, 
we have a lot of open source project. Uh, I think many of them have a commercial opportunity, but we know like that not everyone uh, has a drive to be a businessman. Uh, however, maybe some have or some would like to team up. Um, and the fantastic thing is we already have technology. Yeah? There is maybe not a, a product that is ready for the consumer market, but like a lot of open source uh, applications, they are already very good. Yeah? So it's not like a traditional startup where you say, okay, let's raise money, we have this idea, we hire developers, we do this and that, I really know how to make a pitch and a business plan and uh, my father has some friends. Uh, but like it's really like here we have often technology and uh, um, so we just need the business on top and not like the business and the technology developed. This, so this is more or less the next thing uh, I wanted okay, to talk about. Sorry. No, 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 not at all. You, you, uh, <laughs> it means that my, my sequence is logical. Um, so yes, the, um, the fact that the FOSS Asia Accelerator was announced yesterday uh, is right on the point I now want to hit. The difference, and this is a bit like the entrepreneur first model that I think uh, Meng could describe to us, where many accelerators are uh, a business grad with a PowerPoint deck looking for a code monkey. Um, we're now in the other, we're having the other problem, which is we've got solid engineering and a very large body of existing code. And it's the question is, okay, how do we locate a market and, and service customers and, and, and build businesses on this? And on top of that, and this is I think the uh, the question for FOSS Asia, is there scope to build an institutional structure, call it an accelerator, but the, the details will be specific, to foster that activity? And can FOSS Asia do it? It's the, the second half of the question. To encourage and train and support developers who have an entrepreneurial bent, who have a strong commitment to open source, and who want to build businesses around developing and strengthening ideally existing open source software rather than creating yet another thousand half-baked ideas. Um, and if so, what might such an institution look like? And that's really a question I'd first put in Meng's direction, given your uh, direct experience in running an accelerator. Right. So just to give some background, I, uh, from 2012 onwards, um, I was involved in an accelerator incubator called JFDI, and we made about 70 investments in startups over the course of three years. Um, and we learned some interesting lessons about that, which was that it's not easy to be Y Combinator. Uh, in fact, <laughs> Y Combinator itself uh, had trouble being Y Combinator. They actually started out in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, home of MIT and Harvard, and they weren't doing very well until they moved to Silicon Valley. Uh, so, <laughs> So the lesson there is, I don't know, maybe we need to move to Silicon Valley. But, but that's not the answer we want to hear, is it? And, 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 and like VCs moving out of Silicon Valley at the moment? Right, so that's, that's another pendulum shift. So just the background there is that you know, we recruited teams, uh, a hacker, a hustler, and a hipster to build uh, small companies that would hopefully get big. And we succeeded in doing that reasonably well. Um, and so I think there is an understood model in how to accelerate small startups to the point of break-even profitability Series A in this country and in the region, and just generally that knowledge is out there. Um, it's a different question to say, how do we bring a nonprofit to the same point of sustainability? Because you don't get a lot of social impact investing the way you get a lot of VC investing. Um, and yet, the world is turning towards social impact and social issues and social good. So I see open source software as a fantastic example of a high social impact public good. Now traditionally, this would be the domain of government to fund, right? And you talked about how FOSS Asia has the problem of educating young people who then go off and get jobs and don't necessarily give back. And that problem is very acutely felt by any educational institution in the world, other than possibly Harvard. Um, because. <laughs> Every school faces that problem, and every school has pretty much solved that problem by saying, we're going to have a financial model where you do student loans, or governments will just pay for it. Now, in our world, that doesn't really happen, right? I don't see the government funding open source education. To some extent, they do. You've got GA, and a lot of that is funded by the government. Um, to some extent, people can take loans to go out and get an education. I would argue that most of the time, you don't need to take a loan you just need to have a web browser and the willingness to use um, Stack Overflow instead of Facebook. 
that can be a difficult thing for a lot of people. But this is also partly the, the sort of um, the two different uh, meanings or values we attach to education. One is right. mastering the skill set, mm -hmm. or and or that way of thinking, and the other is getting a bit of paper. Right. And so the the sort of loan driven limited supply of universities, powers to grant degrees, granted by legislators, yada, 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 is about the signaling. Right. It's not about the expertise. Right. And so the, the open source community in particular, because a lot of us do this for the fun of it, has much more interest in the, in the, the former. Yeah. So I think, I know we're talking about the, the where is the money in open source, but it might be interesting to contrast um, our discussion with what might be going on in a different room, in a different track, where they're probably talking about Bitcoin and blockchain. Probably... Uh, this room in two hours. Oh, okay. So in this room in two hours, I guarantee that people will use the term uh, medium of exchange and store of value, right? To talk about what is money. But I would like to play with that idea and say maybe software is a medium of value um, that isn't money, but it definitely has the characteristics of People create it, people spend a lot of time contributing value into helping other people with it, and all the interaction that you get on websites like Stack Overflow is unpaid but incredibly valuable, isn't it? And it creates a long-term store of useful information in the same way that books and papers and journals do, only our kind of information is it's tangible and alive and useful in a way that an academic paper isn't, even though that's the credential that governments are looking for. Right? You can't execute an academic paper. Exactly. Paper. Right. And so I would, just to finish that point, I think, you know, humans, we are not the only animal to use tools. Right? You can think of crows and chimpanzees. And humans are not the only animal to use language. But we are the only animal to use language as a tool. And when we can use language as a tool, at scale, running on hardware, that makes us, I think, that makes programmers the most evolved form of human being out there. <laughs> <laughs> I love the argument. Drifting boldly back towards practicalities. Um, <laughs> Chris, um, so supposing hypothetically we sort of build uh, an institutional structure, an accelerator, um, that is focusing on developing, whether it's startups or whether it's some other structure, uh, organizations that operate and thrive, uh, building, supporting, maintaining open source software. To what extent are uh, the risk averse industries and governments going to be willing to talk to organizations at this scale rather than go to the stable, established, very broad shoulders of Reddit? Uh, sure, so the regulated industries are uh, a great customer base for Red Hat, but it may not be a, a great customer base for startups, for sure. Uh, they tend to be more conservative. They tend to buy from more established companies. So I'm not sure I would advise so much targeting regulated industries. They tend to, uh, when I've seen uh, other open source companies that are smaller, we just purchase uh, CoreOS, for instance. Um, and their customer base had some overlap, but it also, they were targeting, I would say, uh, smaller uh, companies as well that Red Hat may have not paid as much attention to. Okay, so niches arise simply because yeah. of the uh, economies of attention. You, yeah. Red Hat is sort of compelled to focus on bigger, more difficult to service accounts and therefore can't chase the, it's got to eat the deer, it can't chase the mice. Right. Yeah. Okay, so there's, you would estimate any number of those small opportunities to allow um, small organizations to at least get started. Yeah, absolutely. And then I also see, you know, in terms of monetization, there's a traditional software direct sell, but we also see uh, companies have monetized open source in an indirect manner, and then their payment back has been giving back open source. Uh, so if you look at any of the large internet companies, Facebook, Google, uh, et cetera, they are actually uh, centers of innovation for open source, as you saw in the previous talk, uh, with different projects, Cassandra, Kubernetes, et cetera, open compute, and they are certainly, if open source didn't exist, they probably wouldn't exist at the scale that they did so early in their lifetime, right? just to the economies of scale and uh, of open source. But they have been giving back, so they've been good citizens uh, of, of open source, and they've been able to monetize uh, open source as well. A further piece, and that actually 
came up in the last presentation, it hadn't occurred to me in preparing the panel. If you are not in the business of selling software licenses, it's a whole lot easier to share your software. <laughs> right? So um, this is not the Red Hats and the, and the or, or maybe Google, but, but, but I'm thinking, you know, I know Diamond's in the room and there, there are others who are not software companies. And give or take, there are some things that are either far too sensitive or that are differentiating. They spend a great deal on at least integrating and occasionally in sort of not invented here mode, actually reinventing stuff that exists. And in fact, it's beneficial, I would suggest, uh, for them to be using and or sharing and or you know, joining the pool for those things that are not differentiating and where they're not selling licenses or selling product. Yeah, that's a, a constant conversation I have, especially in Silicon Valley. The not invented here, we see a lot of folks uh, at these uh, larger internet companies inventing their own technologies just for the sake of doing that. And uh, sometimes I scratch my head and, and it's actually evolved uh, into a, a more serious challenge because they have a hard time attracting engineers that want to learn this proprietary one-off technology uh, when they're changing jobs every two years We're winning. in the valley. <laughs> so uh, it be, it's becoming more and more difficult with a low unemployment rate. How do you attract engineers? You know, today to, to work on your proprietary junk. <laughs> open source technologies that they can put on their, their resume and they can be relevant uh, to the next uh, assignment. And then also, you know, how do you quickly scale up your new engineers and have them be productive quickly? Well, if you're leveraging open standard, open source technologies, you know, they can come off the street and be a lot more productive, lower your training costs, and as a result, uh, you're going to have a much more efficient organization. So we've definitely had many cases of, of uh, customers who are very much about inventing their own maybe middleware server or their own orchestration tier have definitely changed that opinion as it's become more and more difficult to, uh, to scale out their engineering organization. So that's a piece of what we heard yesterday from Daimler about, in fact, the number one reason for engaging with open source was speed of innovation. Uh, attracting engineers was number two and costs was number three. Right. So I, I, we like to say no one's smarter than everyone, and that's really <laughs> reflective of open source. <laughs> right. So I don't have a whole list of other things. Um, any other, sorry, I don't know. Be quiet on this side. Any other comments at this moment? That yeah, maybe on the social impact thing that Ming mentioned and, and the blockchain thing. I, I do actually believe that that's huge. Uh, I, I was recently we uh, in Istanbul, we, we called it the, whatever, the World Business Angel slash Social Impact uh, Forum. And, and uh, I, I really believe that, that these user cases are strong. So somewhere that interface between social impact um, open source and blockchain somewhere there I, I really see some you know some money coming uh, and maybe even stronger in the social impact piece actually uh, also from a regulatory point of view I think you know all these blockchains I mean what 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 do we really want to do it's it's about inclusion financial inclusion and and that's huge and if we can get and that is a social impact project in itself and it obviously you know there is a yes it's true that European and American investors are more eager to in invest into social impact uh, projects. But here, the social impact project is so, such a big opportunity in this part of the world that it becomes interesting for everyone, including myself. I've, I've done a traditional social impact the investor. I've participated as a mentor in uh, the DBS uh, social innovation programs. So yes, they're not at the scale of uh, American and European programs, but it's, it is happening, and interestingly it's happening not Certainly not exclusively in government, maybe not even primarily in government. I think that there are enough interests outside of government who want to see the society around them function. And then if you add, you know, the Middle East experience and, you know, the whole kind of Islamic thing in terms of how they invest, because it's not, you know, interest or returns, but it has to have that dimension. Uh, and again, I was referring to some of the discussions in Dubai I had, you know, then you get an, another source of financing and you kind of somehow make it I know, I'm just brainstorming here, Sharia compliant, and, and it, then it becomes very attractive. So, can I respond to that point? Please. Um, so, I'd like to, so based on what you've said about social impact and the opportunity for blockchain and open source, that whole nexus, I'd like to propose, you know, this is off the top of my head too, I'm brainstorming, um, I'd like to propose a dichotomy between financial impact and social impact, right? And this is the double bottom line, triple bottom line that we're familiar with. And it seems to me that if the goal is financial impact, who wants to be a millionaire, who wants to make a lot of money, then you're associated with centralizing technologies because 
Like take Visa, for example, right? Visa goes and takes 3% of every transaction, but they are one organization, right? And MasterCard and Amex, but these things tend to centralize. Social impact has different goals, and I would argue that they tend to decentralize, right? And because ultimately, if you want to create social impact, you have to do it at scale, and you can't have you know, the giant red cross go out there and solve everybody's problems. The only way to solve everybody's problems is to have everybody working on it. And so that's na naturally decentralized, and decentralization relies on open protocols. Open protocols rely on open source software. And open source software um, can be connected to blockchain when you look at things like IPFS um, and Filecoin, I think are really interesting examples of how you can um, tokenize an infrastructure decentralized open source, open standard protocol, but also have money around it. So I think that might open a different discussion. I missed one step. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 so the, the project you were describing? Uh, so IPFS, the Interplanetary yeah. File System. Yes, um, and where's, and the, where's the money? Show and me the, the associated, money. so the challenge here is, how do we have a, an internet scale database that is not hosted at AWS? And so the answer is, it has to be hosted in everybody's home behind your little DSL router, right? Now, how do you incentivize people to provide that hosting service and keep your hard drive turned on when you're not at home? And it's a little bit like the BitTorrent question. Some people do it because they're just naturally doing that. But if you put a financial incentive behind it, you say, for every file that belongs to somebody else that I host, I get paid a tiny chunk of coin. Then you've got a financial mechanism to encourage everybody to have a hard drive at home connected to the internet, storing everybody else's data in a decentralized way, which is not AWS. So you've got that protocol, you've got the standard, you've got the software, and you've got the coin. So that points a little bit towards uh, one of the ideas that, uh, Mario, you had proposed, which was not a very formed idea, but a sort of a straw man for discussion, was a decentralized sharing economy platform. Imagine OpenBNB. Setting aside the problem of telling people where you're sleeping, that's, that's creepy and dangerous. But um, that right now we are, that all the, the sharing economy companies are built on the fact that they simultaneously solve inventory and discovery, payment clearance, and dispute resolution. If we can decentralize, firstly decouple these three things, and secondly decentralize them, then we have a shot perhaps at producing open systems that are sort of community-wide for the communities they serve. Is that a, am I talking in the right direction? Well, it's, it's a lot of uh, different uh, uh, topics. Yes, okay, I mean, decentralization is, is a big topic for years. Um, we've worked on the um, Yassi search engine, like in the Force Asia, we make a front end uh, for this search engine. Um, so it's decentralized, uh, it's been used in governments and so on. So um, yeah, we're working on this and uh, decentralization is, is definitely great. Um, but here also the question was in the past uh, how to commercialize it. Yeah. So if we can go uh, that way, if, if there's maybe blockchain or some technology is, is a solution, um, that would be great. Um, but like already companies are using decentralized uh, uh, infrastructures uh, themselves. Like even one company can have different services. So oh, but uh, my argument was, was broader than that. So think about the, the, the hypothetical open BNB. Uh, let's use an IPFS or some sort of distributed ledger or blockchain system to deal with the storing and the processing of the data and the listing and the discovery problem, which are things that these distributed systems are good at, these distributed technical systems are good at, you still have to solve payment clearing and you still have to solve dispute resolution. And that's the second one, what? Dispute resolution. Yes. I turned up and your house didn't exist mm -hmm. or it was extremely filthy or whatever, or you claim that I damaged your house and someone has to make decisions. That service is worth real money. Yeah. PayPal's three and a half percent, most of that is in fact a spirit solution. Well, this is the question. I mean, like, maybe here if we could learn from the uh, open source community, right? I mean, like, how, how are issues resolved here? How are, like, disputes are resolved? Um, some communities are better this and the, at this and some are not. Like, at Force Asia, we have the best practices, um, which we try as a guideline and, like, in most of the cases, they work out. Um, so it's, it's a web of trust, right? We had that uh, uh, discussed elsewhere. So um, if you could form a web of trust and, and people say, okay, I trust this person because another one trusts them. If you can use new technologies, that would be great. 
Um, but in that case, again, I'm asking like, so will this all be open source? So um, if yes, then I'm, I'm yeah, definitely for it. Uh, so um, like the open Airbnb, yeah, like something like that would be great. Yeah, so, but we need it open. So that, that what's the business model then? Sort of what I was, what I was guessing at was, was you can open the, uh, the application, but you still need human effort to resolve disputes. That's a real economic value. People pay actual money for that. As in the PayPal case, it's 3.5% of every transaction. Most of that is, in fact, about dispute resolution. That, and in fact, one of the problems for blockchain currencies is that that doesn't exist. If I transfer money to you and then we have a dispute, well, I'm stuffed. Yeah. And so there's this real value in providing dispute resolution services and perhaps allowing an open market for multiple. So right now, if you're trading oil, you're not locked into one mechanism. There are multiple mechanisms available that operate somewhat competitively. And they are run at a profit. So you're building open software and open systems that don't have lockout. But your question is, you know, how do our would-be entrepreneurs that we wish to help accelerate, how do they make money in this context in order to feed themselves? So I'm, I'm having difficulties to judge when will we be at this stage to have the technology ready. I mean, when, when will we actually all use blockchain and, instead of like normal money? I mean, there are some use cases where, where it can be used now and uh, maybe for big transactions and like, yes. But uh, when it will be ready, I mean, there's a lot of talk about it. So uh, well, I'm, I'm not suggesting that it has to be a, a blockchain based on money. Yeah, well, an that's, a another that's, a, that's a whole separate question. Uh, nothing else comes to my mind that could solve mm. this problem. PayPal <laughs> raises the, the obvious yeah, model, right? Yeah, PayPal, but like then you, you, you need, it's, it's, a, it's a bank. And uh, um, it's difficult like, to scale up. At least in Europe, PayPal is a bank, so um, it's difficult to scale up. So actually, I, I, I like the, what Meng said like, uh, about the experience, like making small, star or small ideas into, into like, a break-even point, into Series A, something like that. I think that, w that is what we would like to achieve. And um, so the question is, how, how can we go here? I got a few ideas, so that's, uh, that's great. And um, like we are looking for mentors, we are looking for partners, um, yeah, people who would like to invest. Yeah, so that uh, that would be great. And um, we are in a super big growing market. Yeah, I mean most of the developers that we have are from India. We have a lot in Vietnam, um, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. So um, yeah, this is where everyone wants to go because here we need new solutions. Um, Blockchain example is a, is a technology, yes. uh, but you need the people and process, and so the person in the future may not be physical, may be a, a computer program that does the dispute resolution, but you'll still need the, the person to do the enforcement. So just on okay. the, another reaction to dispute resolution, I think you know it's it's all about kind of governance and 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 how do you actually solve dispute resolution? And I do believe that there are learnings from the open source community how you do governments in a community. Uh, and I think, uh, actually, I don't think we should go to Visa uh, or to Bitcoin to kind of get uh, whatever um, inspired, but actually how our community projects solved in general in terms of dispute resolution. And I think that's the future of governments. It must be based on something, some criteria. It doesn't have to be a centralized body like a PayPal or, or a Visa. No. And that's what is so powerful. Now, I don't have the magic formula what that would look like. But that's where I think the solution is. I, I'd point out that it's already visible in large um, markets between, in distribution chains. If you're buying a commodity, you're not locked into, that, that the market for oil, that there are only it's like two price setting markets and six secondary markets for light, sweet, crude, for example. They're not locked into one dispute resolution mechanism. There are competing providers of dispute resolution services that are used by participants in those markets. And so I, th I think we can get away from centralization and nonetheless, but nonetheless produce profitable businesses that are providing a real value, uh, perhaps with the help of an AI, perhaps not, but that are providing something that has real economic value without getting into uh, centralized mechanisms. Hadn't thought about the sort of local community level mechanisms that implicitly exist. That might be a better starting point than ADR, the, the, the mechanisms used in, in international markets. So the, yeah, there are, there are many things other than central solutions. And I think a lot of those companies, you know, like you, you mentioned Airbnb, you mentioned Uber, you mentioned LinkedIn, you mentioned PayPal. How would you start these companies today? 
Yeah. You know, <laughs> it, uh, definitely not the way from a very centralized structure that, that they used to. I always give you this example. Like, uh, I was one of the first LinkedIn users in, in Europe. And um, I, I basically emailed 1,000 of my friends and called them and said, do you want to use LinkedIn? I've just sent you an invite by email. And the other people would take up the phone. What are you talking about? Well, I trust me, it is something that will be useful. So I did that for 1,000 people. Wow. And, I, and I got a small little letter of Raid Hoffman saying, thank you, I just IPO'd my company. <laughs> and you know, that was not very sharing from my point of view. We built a lot of value there, right? At least he sent you a note. Right. So I think so if I would start a LinkedIn or a PayPal or, or an Airbnb or a Uber today, I would start on the sharing principle that whoever shares gets something for it, right? And that is way more in, in my world than just the salt that I mentioned about the decent salary. It can be way more because basically you're sharing, you're getting a benefit. And that's what me, I think, is talking about, you know, some kind of token or whatever it's going to be called, right? But it's real, based on real sharing, not on this hype that we see out there. Well, that's also a principle for a, a, a system based on openness and community-wide problem solving rather than on exclusion and then you know, externalizing costs. So that we, we haven't got time to touch the Islamic finance question, but actually that happens to be the basis for Islamic finance rules. It's an interesting piece. Uh, there's one final question I want to put to the panel, but it occurs to me I've forgotten to ask the audience. Um, are there any questions from the audience at this point? putting everyone to sleep. All right. Um, okay. In that case, I will now I'll tackle the final uh, topic I want to put to the panel. Um, oh, yep. Yep. So you last, last thing discussed was something really interesting about that, well, sharing model built into this new enterprises that are about to be started. And then Fosasia Incubator is one example of such enterprise. So maybe you want to talk about that one a little bit, how it's going to be addressed there. Right, so Mario, do you want to describe the plans for the Fosasia Incubator in this session? Or is that a topic for another day? You mean like uh, what, what we want to do? Uh, uh. Build, building a well, company with a social impact or enterprise with a social impact, which was Asia is. And then there was a question of sharing and participating in that and being incentivized, you know, by yeah. some kind of structure or do you have well, any plans I, for that? I can mention a bit what FOSS Asia is. I mean, uh, and uh, so FOSS Asia is a, co is a community. We also set it up uh, as a company here in Singapore, which is basically to run the event. Um, and uh, yeah, so Actually, if we look to the US or Europe, you can't do things in the same way uh, here in Asia. Like you can't just uh, register an NGO and uh, say, okay, we organize an event in China. Yeah, I mean, uh, and uh, as you can see, the Linux Foundation, for example, they also set up a company to set, uh, to organize the Open Source Summit in China, I think. So these were some challenges that we were thinking for several years and we didn't find a perfect solution. So if anyone has ideas, please come to me. Um, I think we have the same thing when we organize something in India and, and so on. So how, how to, how to yeah, run, run an event without an organization. So, um, so originally it was like a community mainly and just out of necessities we uh, have organizations uh, to, to run things. So um, now as the times have changed, I'm originally from Berlin, right? Germany. So I, I saw like in the 90s a lot of people like they're coding in the hacker space and the sea base and so on and uh, actually nobody cared about money. Like even people said free software also means free. I don't care, right? Uh, no need. Uh, and uh, yeah, things here in Asia have changed but also in Europe they have changed. Um, and they say, listen, I need to make an income. I need to make money. I need to fund my family. Look, everyone is, has a startup. Things are growing. So I say, why don't we do this with uh, open source? And I'm a bit puzzled also if I look at the old ones, if we say the, the real model is the data and um, actually uh, the software, we are not selling software. Why Airbnb is not open source? Why Eventbrite is not open source? Uh, if the model is actually the data and not the software itself. Um, okay, so. It tends to be more on the Linux layer or on the backend layer, on, on, on different layers, but we don't see it so much as a real complete service. Like uh, I like the services like WordPress, for example. Um, everyone can run it, you can extend it. It's, it's, it's a nice model, so I would like to see more models like that where, where people can share it. So I would like to support these kind of models. 
And we don't have huge resources uh, um, at Force, Force Asia, but we have a lot of contacts, we have friends, we have sometimes people who say, oh yeah, I would love to invest in something that makes sense for me. And uh, I think like in order to make a real uh, like successful company in a way that break even point, generate income, you don't need two million. Maybe you need 200,000, yeah? If it's a free software company, because you have a lot of people contributing and they can also use it for their uh, uh, business. For example, we have this Eventier system, uh, uh, open event. They, uh, it's not ready for everyone yet, um, but I would say uh, I'm, I'm not going to run uh, this in Sri Lanka. Yeah? I'm not going to run this uh, in Korea. So it would be great to see people using these kind of systems and uh, let's say uh, take away some market share from uh, Eventbrite. Yeah? So things like this would be great and actually uh, we want to support these kind of um, uh, projects and ideas, people who make apps um, on open standards. Why not have an Instagram version in Japanese? Uh, but it's not Instagram, it's an open source. Instagram and we're all using the same standards, we're all using the same APIs, uh, um, you, you can put it together. And there are ideas like uh, I think for Twitter there's an alternative uh, MetaMost uh, um, and um, yeah, people are starting this and we want to be part of this. So, uh, so it's great and so if you have ideas, um, uh, I'm happy uh, to share more details um, like uh, for example like we also own a small uh, uh, hotel in uh, Vietnam and one of our ideas was, okay, so let's see, let's, let's see this accelerator and let's see what resources we have. People, it's not, it's not only about money, it's also about resources. So why we don't offer like, hey, hey, you have a startup, you want to make a workshop, why don't you come over for a month, stay in our hotel, use our office, use everything, focus on it. Um, and what you want to do, we help you, we can like have uh, calls together with different people, investors, or whoever can help to make your project run in a sustainable way so after you finish your studies you don't have to go uh, really to work for a big company or like pitch with uh, like somebody from the business department you can actually grow your own thing and I think this is what we've seen uh, um, like as far as I understand from, from Google and others they actually come from a tech background and um, yeah so I don't know so I think we can have a separate session uh, on, on this but like it gives you a few ideas I want to put one final question, and I know we're going to just slightly overshoot. Um, it'll be a question to Chris, but it's uh, perhaps Meng could, well, uh, yeah, hang on, Meng, hang on to your mic, because I'm going to ask you to motivate the question. It's a problem with extrinsic versus intrinsic motivations, and it's what happens when uh, you sort of pour money into an area that's full of people who are doing stuff for the love of it and who are volunteers. Um, and I think the, the way you expressed it yesterday was it might actually be a violation of the social contract to introduce contractors. <laughs> um, you, made an, you gave an example about uh, teaching uh, dolphins and chimps to use money, I think. And the question to Chris will be how does Red Hat avoid this? So, but please, if you want to set out the question. Yeah, so uh, I think the research shows that if you pay people to be creative, they will end up being less creative than if you hadn't paid them and they were doing it out of love and passion. And the question of, you know, is the love of money the root of all evil? Um, it is, I think, there's recent um, social science primate research that shows you can train chimpanzees to participate in a monetary economy. You can pay them in cucumbers, you can pay them in grapes, um, you can train dolphins, right? A any sophisticated brain is able to grasp the concept of trade and money. And, um, and if you don't pay a chimpanzee what that chimpanzee is worth, it, is, it, get, it gets really angry at you. Um, and I feel like, to a certain degree, talking about paying open source developers um, sort of creates this, uh, it sort of brings us into that world where we're sullying the purity and the beauty of it. Of course, it's easy to talk about purity and beauty when you're not actually poor and worried about where your next <laughs> paycheck is coming from. So yes. we have to balance these tensions. Yes. So, so my question then to, to Red Hat, it's not so much, um, not actually the direct problem of you know, engineers coming on board, remaining engaged, but have you had the problem of bringing your sort of paid engineers into a, an existing project um, and perhaps pursuing objectives that the project's existing maintainers aren't so excited about and or become disengaged because now there's paid guys sort of pushing for stuff to happen? Sure, I mean, there certainly are politics in all communities, so uh, 
Um, we've definitely had our fair share of uh, community disagreements, technology-wise, uh, political-wise, customer-wise. <laughs> Very polite yeah. way of saying it. <laughs> so, uh, I think that's to be expected. Has there been uh, a sort of widely applicable strategy to limiting the scope or damage that that does? Uh, sure. So I think good uh, project governance, uh, setting that up as in the talk before this, we talked about uh, setting up the, uh, the Linux Foundation uh, and how they run their uh, uh, communities. And we've learned from Red Hat and we've been advising uh, private companies on how to set up their own internal kind of open source communities as well. So that's one aspect is just getting a company within itself to start sharing code across organizations and having governance and enabling uh, uh, contributions and collaboration there. You heard that one last year actually from IBM yep. where the idea that the connections team's source was visible to every single IBM engineer on earth was unprecedented. And suddenly they were getting patch, they were getting pull requests from people they'd never heard of who they didn't know were using their software in you know, as Uzbekistan, for the sake of argument. So, yeah, that. Sure. Uh, but, we, uh, you know, at Red Hat, we tend to uh, hire those folks that are already actively involved in communities, and it doesn't matter where they live in the world, uh, but it, it's more about what they're doing in the community and the influence that they have so that we can leverage that on behalf of our customer base. Yeah. So those are really the two thoughts I wanted to offer to Forsage. That one, yeah, you're going to do it anyway, hire the community leaders, but the other is pay close attention to governance. Um, when this engagement starts to happen, because it, it won't always go right, but you can make it go badly less frequently by, by paying attention to it. Uh, we're now over time, so uh, I think at this point, uh, may I have a round of thanks for the, the panelists?